my name is Steve Jurek. I'm with uh, Miami Valley. I'm with Miami Valley Golf, and uh, Todd Johnson is here as well, as well as all of our staffs. Uh, so we just want to thank you for coming out and spending some time with us. Uh, your knowledge helps our game, and so we appreciate that investment. I also want to thank Miami Valley Cable Council. They'll be filming today's presentation, and then we'll share the links throughout the golf community if you feel like you missed something or didn't hear our guests speak correctly. So with that said, our guest joined the USGA eight years ago. She started as a Rules of Golf associate, answering thousands of rules inquiries each year. Currently, Catherine works as the Director of Rules Championships while managing the rules operations at the USGA Championships. Prior to joining the USGA, Catherine graduated from Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa, with a degree in sport management and business. In addition, she played three years on the women's golf team. So please welcome Catherine Belanger with the USGA. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very excited to get to spend the next few hours with all of you and, and chat about these. Uh, we'll start with the rules changes, and then we will move into some kind of general rules content, as I like to call it. Um, I grew up outside of Chicago. Uh, my parents both went to the University of Dayton, so anytime I can kind of get back to this area is very nice. Um, so excited, as I said, to be here with all of you. Uh, as we move through the presentation, I would just encourage you, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Um, I would hate for somebody to leave without getting a question that they had answered. Um, I may ask, depending upon how deep the question goes, that perhaps we, we chat during one of the breaks today, um, just because I don't want to cause more confusion than uh, help would be given, depending upon what the question is. But as I said, we're gonna start off by talking about these 23 changes that we have to the rules of golf. We're a few months into these changes now, so hopefully maybe a bit more of a refresher for some than brand new information. Um, but if it is new information, that's okay. We're still gonna get it out to all of you. So just to start with the background on the, the process that we went through of making this uh, rules revision cycle, we're definitely back to what we could think of as more of a normal rules revision compared to what we just went through in 2019, that massive rules modernization project that we had. This was really about continuing on with a lot of those initiatives that we had in 2019. And the first one being this concept of trying to make the rules easier to understand and apply. Now, Obviously, I think a lot of us in this room know there is a lot of complexity in the rules of golf, and perhaps they're not always easy to understand and apply, but that really is a continual effort that we look at. You know, how can we use more plain language, making sure that we have all of the necessary rules information in the rules themselves and not hidden away in what we now call these clarifications. Um, as Steve mentioned, I started off answering questions on the rules of golf, and I'd be on the phone with someone, and they'd be you know, looking right at the exact rule that they needed to, and they would say, look, I don't know what this is saying. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is to my question. They got to the right spot, but they still couldn't get to the right answer. Um, so I think we're in a much better place where if you can at least get to the right spot, I think you are much more likely to be able to figure out what that answer is to your question. Inclusivity was certainly a big part of this initiative. Um, you may have picked up on some pronoun changes that we had in the rules of golf, and that's certainly been a bit of an evolution. We started off for many years with just that male pronoun he, then we moved to he or she, and now we've just gone to the neutral they. Um, and perhaps the, the biggest way that we've tried to make the rules more inclusive is through a brand new rule of golf at the back of the book there, Rule 25, the modifications for players with disabilities. And that certainly had a long-standing history. It started off as a entirely separate publication, not even part of the rules of golf. Then in 2019, we made the effort to move it into the rules, but it was as a model local rule. 
And if you think about it, it doesn't quite add up. If you have players with disabilities, the fact that the committee would have to go through the process of adopting it as a model local rule, you know, it just doesn't quite make sense. You know, players who can go out and enjoy the game, I mean, that's what all of us are trying to do. And these modifications are now just there. They have the same standing as every other rule of golf. They're readily available for players who need them. And we don't have to go through any, you know, kind of hoops of the committee making sure that they adopt them as a local rule. I'll touch on it uh, when we get to Rule 25 at the very end of this presentation. Uh, but the USGA, we hosted our very first Adaptive Open last year, uh, which certainly was a big success. And, you know, just again, trying to be more inclusive and opening up the USGA championship for that community. Sustainability, uh, if you have attended one of the PGA USGA Rules of Golf workshops, you only would have gotten two publications in the mail as part of that. We are down one publication from where we were in 2019. We have that small pocket size, what we call the player edition of the Rules of Golf. And I think all of us could recognize that, you know, we give those out to, you know, thousands, if not more golfers for each rule cycle. Those books, they go in the bag, never to be seen again, right? They're not coming back out. And I don't know the exact number, uh, but there were, I believe, millions of pages that basically had to be incinerated when we turned the page to these 23 rules of golf. You know, we printed all these books, they sit in bags, and then in four years, we've just got to get rid of them all. So what we've done for player-focused rules rather than that book, almost all of us now at this point, we've got that smartphone and you can download the USGA Rules of Golf app. If you don't have that on your phone, I would definitely encourage you to make sure you have it there. Um, and that's really what has replaced the player's edition. That's something that we can update in real time if we are making any changes. And it does have a more player focused where when you go to the landing page, as long as you're not turning on expert mode, it's gonna show a picture of a course and you'll be able to pick out, you know, I wanna look at putting green rules. I wanna look at penalty area rules. Much more geared towards the average golfer as opposed to perhaps some of us in this room acting as referees. So we've uh, moved away from having that player's edition and then we just have those two publications which are really geared towards those of us in this room, right? You're acting as an official, perhaps you're administering tournaments, you wanna make sure in those cases that you have the full rules of golf as well as the official guide. And that has a ton of great information, you've got all those clarifications as well as in the back of the book, you could almost think of that as kind of how to conduct a competition. What are the things you wanna think about, the model local rules that are available? So a ton of great information there, but information that the average player, they don't need to be worried about. Another part of the 2019 Rules Modernization Project was moving what we called decisions at the time into the rules themselves. I talked about how I could be on the phone with someone and they'd be looking at the exact rule that they needed and they couldn't get to the answer. The other piece that made the rules so challenging is you could read the rule, understand the rule, but if you didn't know that there was a decision or two hiding, you could very well get to the wrong answer. Decisions very frequently were rulemaking in nature. So with the 2019 project, what we tried to do was move what we originally called interpretations and tried to make them not rulemaking. Let's give guidance, let's give examples, help committees get to answers, but the goal was for those not to be rulemaking. We went through a big effort to get decisions that were rulemaking into the rules themselves. And I think this is gonna be a continual review we see with each rules revision. I'm sure we could have looked at some uh, interpretations in the 2019 book and said, mm, you know, this is, getting, this is getting close. This is towing the line of becoming rulemaking. And so we reviewed those and moved them as needed into the rules of golf. And you would have noticed in that official guide, rather than continuing with interpretations, we now have clarifications. And one of the things we did with the 2019 rules was we started issuing what were called clarifications quarterly. And what was so great about these clarifications is it allowed the USGA and RNA to react in real time. 
right? Rather than recognizing we had outcomes and rules that weren't operating as intended, not in the best interest of the game, rather than having to live with those for two, four years, whatever it might be, quarterly, we could issue a clarification and update it and really act in the best interest of the game. But what that led to is we had clarifications living online and then interpretations in the book. So it was a little bit of an odd dynamic about how those two items related. So we've renamed everything to be clarifications. We're gonna continue on with issuing clarifications quarterly, and those are additional digital clarifications. But now, those two things have the same status. We don't have this odd dynamic of, well, what's a clarification and what's an interpretation? Um, so if, as you're out there refereeing over the course of the year, definitely would be helpful to check on those uh, digital clarifications. As I mentioned, they're updated quarterly. So just a good thing to check in on and make sure that you've got the most up-to-date information. And then we have this idea of reducing penalties where appropriate. We often talk about wanting to make sure that the, the penalty is gonna outweigh the potential advantage a player could have gained through their actions. Golf is different from a lot of other sports in many ways, and one of those is that players aren't breaking rules as part of their normal play, right? They're not trying to break a rule as part of their strategy. Most of the time, penalties are happening because the player was unaware. They didn't realize what they were gonna do was a breach, or they were taking penalty relief. They weren't trying to breach a rule, but they happened to. And so we look at that scale. What's the potential advantage versus what is the penalty? And are those operating as we want, or perhaps is the penalty too severe? And so we'll start out with some penalty changes that really reflect that. A couple instances where we looked at, you know, our scale isn't quite in balance the way we want it to be. And again, this is another item that I think every rules revision we look at. Do penalties make sense? Does the penalty fit the crime or is it more severe than it needs to be? These are the, the big buckets of rule changes that we are going to be chatting about. Um, I will kind of pause as we move through each change and definitely after each bucket. Um, so again, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand um, and I'm more than happy to take those as we are chatting for the next little bit here. We'll start off with some penalty application changes. There's a few changes that we're gonna talk about today that I'm gonna call out as being perhaps more important than some other changes, right? Some are a little bit more in the weeds and others really are major changes. And this is absolutely one that should be kind of leaping off the screen as being a major change. We've had this concept in the rules of player either breaches the same rule multiple times, they breach multiple rules. What are we doing with those penalties? Is the player gonna get one penalty? Do we need multiple penalties? And this rule was easily one of the most challenging rules that we've had in our book. As our rules team would get questions about, you know, is this one penalty? Should this be multiple penalties? And we'd be discussing that internally a lot of the time it was, well, this feels like it should be one penalty. This feels like it should be multiple penalties. And when you think about trying to make the rules easier to understand and apply, if we're getting to answers kind of based on a rule's gut feeling, well, that's not making the rules easy to understand and apply. That's not ensuring that different committees as much as possible are gonna get to the same outcome. So we took a step back and tried to look at the structure and figure out a way to perhaps do it differently and make it easier to apply. And the thought process behind this is most of the time, a general penalty is gonna cover what the player did. That loss of hole in match play, two strokes in stroke play, most of the time that's gonna be enough. If we are in between intervening events, we're gonna to lump together all of the penalties that a player had. And when we talk about intervening events, we only have two. We've got the completion of a stroke and then becoming aware of a breach. And we've gotta keep in mind that becoming aware of a breach includes doubt. 
once the player has some doubt about what happened, they've become aware of that breach and that has now, is now acting as this intervening event. So I do think overall, this is a, a more simple approach, but I've used this phrase a, a number of times, it's just a different mindset that us as referees, we've got to get into. You know, we've been used to operating the way we have for quite some time, and now we've got to just take a step back and we've got to really key in on where and when did these intervening events happen? That's what we're looking for. So if we think of the situation, I make a stroke, I go forward, I find that ball, and there is a big branch right there in my backswing. So I decide I'm gonna just break that off. That's in my way. I break it off, I turn to somebody in my group, and I ask for some advice. How do you think I should play this shot? I pull out my range finder, and I shoot the yardage with my slope feature turned on. I'm up to three different rules breaches. I'm not aware and I haven't completed another stroke. I am in between intervening events. Once I make that next stroke, we're gonna look back to my last intervening event, which was the previous stroke that I completed, and those three rules breaches I had, they all get lumped together. I'm either gonna lose the hole in match play, we always have that nice, easy answer in match play, and in stroke play, it's gonna be two strokes. Two strokes is gonna cover what I just did. So again, we're getting to an easier rule to apply, but we've really got to key in on when and when did these intervening events happen? Because we could get to a different outcome in that same sequence. I complete the stroke and I go forward. I break off that branch and somebody in the group turns to me and goes, Catherine, what are you doing? That's a breach. I've now become aware. So if we're in that stroke play situation, I've earned two penalty strokes. Then I go ahead and I ask for some advice and I use that slope feature on my range finder. And then I complete another stroke. Well, the act of improving conditions is separated out by intervening events. That's gonna be a two stroke penalty and stroke play and those other two breaches between intervening events, those get lumped together. So I'm getting a total of four penalty strokes in that case. So again, it's just a different mindset where we really need to key in on when did these intervening events take place? We have an exception though, that if the player causes that ball to move and fails to replace it, we're always gonna treat that as a general penalty. And this is how we've operated for a very long time in the rules of golf. But when you think about a player who causes their ball to move, they're almost automatically on edge, right? What just happened? What do I do? Is there a penalty? And we didn't want that initial reaction that a player has to become doubt. We didn't want that to be treated as doubt and then result in the player in the stroke play situation getting a total of three penalty strokes. So again, player fails to replace that ball that they caused to move, we're gonna treat that as being just a general penalty. And then we have to remember that if we have taken penalty relief, that doesn't go away. We don't get any sort of discount on that. If I take relief from a penalty area and then play from the wrong place, stroke play, I'm still getting that total of three. Those penalty strokes for taking relief, those are never going to go away. The player is going to be stuck with those. So I will pause here before we move on to our next penalty application change. Um, as I said, it's a new mindset for all of us to get into, uh, but happy to, to answer any questions if we have any right now. The general penalty is always two strokes. The general penalty in stroke play is two strokes, in match play it's loss of hole. As I've done these presentations and uh, a couple of our workshops, this is either an item that we get almost no questions on, or we could talk about it for another 10 or 15 minutes. The next penalty application change that we have here relates to substitution. And this is a situation where we're looking at that balance, that scale. Does the penalty fit the crime or perhaps is the penalty too severe? You've got a player who marks and lifts their ball on the putting green. They go to their bag and grab their very favorite putting ball and replace that. 
that general penalty felt a little bit too harsh for what the potential advantage was. So now, if substitution is all the player gets wrong, it's just going to be one penalty stroke. We've gone ahead and reduced that. And then same thing if you are using this optional model local rule, our one ball local rule, player breaches that over multiple holes, it's just going to be that one penalty stroke. Okay, so our next bucket that we're going to move into uh, relates to some equipment changes that we have. So the first topic we'll talk through is a damaged club and how are we going to operate. The first thing we've got to now recognize is that damage is a really broad application in the rule. It is simply just changing any part, feature, property of a club because of an act. We don't have that you know, high standard here that we often think about of being significantly damaged. That's not built into this part of the rule. If any part of that club gets changed, it just gets nicked as you're making a stroke, that is damage that happened during the round. When we have that damage during the round, this isn't a change, but we're going to continue to treat that club as being conforming. And so what that means, player is free to continue making strokes with that club for the rest of the round. They don't necessarily need to do anything. And as long as we don't have player abuse, as long as it, the club didn't get damaged due to a player abusing the club, they're gonna be free to either repair or replace the club. We've got Ernie up on the slide here. He's wrapped that club around the tree and it's broken in half. Very clearly a damaged club. He can keep using it, he can repair it, or he can replace it. Now the difference being you've got a player who rather than the club gets damaged in making a stroke, perhaps that club goes over the knee. We still have a damaged club. The player is still going to be allowed to make strokes with that damaged club, but now we're in that abuse territory. Now the player is unable to repair or replace the club. When we've got abuse of the club, we don't get those additional options in the rule. And this is what we like to call that default position in the rules. No local rules, committee doesn't do anything. This is the default of how this rule is going to operate. What the committee has the option to do is use this model local rule G9. What G9 does is it is going to raise the bar for what kind of damage we need to repair or replace the club. In order, excuse me, or just for the replacement, in order to replace the damaged club, we need it to be broken or significantly damaged. That is a higher standard than what the default position is in the rules of golf. Now, this is a model local rule that we use at USGA Championships, um, and for the player to be able to replace the club, we need it to be broken or significantly damaged. So just that club that gets the little nick on it, that's not gonna be enough. We needed to reach a higher standard in order for the player to get to that replacement option. And we've had this local rule for the last, um, I think almost four years, most of this last rule cycle we had it. We started off in the 2019 rules with a really simple approach. You start with 14 clubs player, and those are your clubs for the round. No replacement. Uh, and pretty quickly, we kind of backtracked on that. and we issued this model local rule to allow for replacement. Um, but in these new rules, again, that default position, player can replace for any damage as long as it's not abuse. And if you want to raise the bar, we've got this local rule available. External attachments to the club. This is, this is an item that relates back to an incident that happened with Rory Sabatini a few years ago that you may recall. He uh, was out on the range getting ready to go using that track man with these stickers like we see on the club. And he started his round with those stickers on the club. Now the equipment rules consider these to be a non-permissible external attachment. What this change allows for now is as long as you haven't made a stroke with that club, go ahead, take the stickers off, 
and you can use that club for the rest of the round. Certainly more common now that players are out there using TrackMan type devices as they're getting ready to go. There really isn't any advantage when that club hasn't been used in making a stroke. So we can go ahead, get the stickers or whatever the, the non-permissible external attachment is off, and then we're good to keep using that club for the rest of the round. Related to building a club, we have uh, for a while prohibited the player from adding a club if they are building it through components that either the player is carrying or somebody else is carrying for the player. What we've also added in now is that if components are being carried by someone else, those components are also going to be off limits. So if somebody else in your group has some club components when you're allowed to either add or replace a club, you can't borrow those components to build a club. We have a few items here related to green reading materials. Uh, the first being the, the, again, that default position in the rules that when we have the size and scale limits, and this is found in a clarification in rule 4.3, the size and scale requirements for green reading materials is now going to be triggered when you are making a stroke from on the putting green. Previously, we had said if you're making a stroke with the putter, intending the ball to come to rest on the putting green, that these restrictions turned on. Now, it's a bit of a cleaner approach that look, once that ball is on the putting green, now these restrictions have turned on and they are in play. Model local rule G12 is new for this year. And this really relates, as does the basic rule, the default rule that I mentioned, to the belief that the USGA and the RNA have that being able to read a putting green to figure out that line of play is really an essential skill in the game. And because of that belief, we put some guardrails in place to protect that skill, that judgment, that ability. And so this local rule is for committees who want to place even more emphasis on the skill and ability. And what this rule now will do is once the player's ball gets on the putting green, player is on their own to figure out the line of play. Player has a caddy, they're obviously still able to get help from the caddy, but neither the player or the caddy can use any written, printed, digital, electronic materials to figure out the line of play. Once that ball's on the putting green with this local rule, player is gonna be on their own to figure it out. Uh, this is an item that we are planning to use at our amateur championships. Uh, we won't have any local rules in effect related to green reading materials during qualifying rounds, but for our amateur championships, once we get to the championship proper, we are planning to use G12 at our championships. So yes? Catherine, so the GPS devices, that are in a cart and people may be for a particular uh, tournament or something using the carts, you park proximity to the green, it automatically pops up the green and shows you exactly all of the contours of the green and your ball's already resting on the green. So are you under breach looking at the GPS or do you have to have some other thing so that you don't incur penalties because this, this cart is giving you that in breach of that rule? Sure. So the question was related to carts that have, you know, a GPS and is automatically going to pull up an image of the putting green. Well, for starters, if we assume no local rules in effect, right, we're just operating under the rules of golf as they are. Um, it's about use. So if you use that to help figure out your line of play, it's got to meet the size and the scale requirements. If it's never used, that we don't have any issue. Um, if we're using model local rule G12, which again, as player, you're on your own to figure it out, it's still about use, right? It's are you using that to help figure out the line of play? Um, so those are the questions that, you know, you've got to work through um, if you think you've got a breach or a potential breach, I should say. Trying to work away from the feeling part of it. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. So the approach, you can look at a, a uh, printed material or whatever on an approach shot, but you just not when you get on the green, correct? Correct. And then you're talking about with Model Local Rule G12. Yeah. So with Model Local G12 in effect, players can still use yardage books. This isn't the player can never pull out a yardage book. You know, I'm on the T on a par three and I'm trying to figure out yardage, where I want to land it. I can take that book out of my pocket and do that. I can make other notes in the book throughout my round. But again, once that ball's on the putting green, now I can't use that yardage book to figure out the line of play. All right, before we move on to scorecards, I know we had a couple questions, at least on the green reading materials. Any other equipment, equipment questions that we want to tackle? What is the uh, limits of when a club is damaged without the model of the rule being in effect? Any scratch anywhere on the club? Yeah, exactly. It's a great clarification. Again, we have a extremely broad, extremely liberal new definition of damage. If any part, feature, property of the club gets changed, that's a damaged club. Yeah. When you talk about replacement of the club, so I break my club. Can I send the caddy into the clubhouse and get another club? Excuse me. Yes. So if you are able to replace a club, we do have some guardrails around that. One of those being that you can't unreasonably delay play. But if you keep playing and Caddy runs into the shop and grabs another club for you, that's okay. Maybe we go back to the first subject. <laughs> so I have a, a very simple one that happens on the putting green all the time in, in that a, a player marks their ball, is asked to move the marker to the right, then puts from the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then is made aware that they did that brings the ball back and puts it in the correct place and puts. What, what are the intervening events that have occurred in that situation? Yeah, so let's, we'll go back to uh, our penalty application changes. I uh, felt like we got through it too quickly. <laughs> Thought I skated through. So I mark and lift my ball from the putting green. Somebody asks me to move that ball marker to the side. I do that and I forget to put it back. So I replace it in that new spot and I play. I've played from a wrong place, but I have completed a stroke. That is an intervening event. So in stroke play, I'm going to get two penalty strokes. We are very, very likely not getting into a serious breach there. But I think I need to correct it. So I lift the ball from the new position, put it back to where it was originally, and play from there. I have completed a stroke. That is a separate intervening event. So in stroke play, that's going to result in a total of four penalty strokes. Uh, question on original equipment. Let's say you, you have a potter, some paint falls off in front of the potter, there's a little indentation. Can you now, this is not the same as the original coming out, can you still use that club? Or do you call it, can you repair it with a paint? Yeah, so question there was if the putter has some paint that starts to come off of the face of the club. And I will say, and I don't think I'm alone in this feeling, equipment questions always make me nervous and give me a little bit of pause when we're dealing with clubs. It's not a rule that we deal with too frequently. Um, and so definitely when I get those club questions, my antenna's kind of up on edge. Um, I, I believe the club would be considered damaged. Um, but I'm going to pause on being able to kind of repaint it um, and try to check in with our equipment standards team. So let me circle back on that. When you say modern local rule, does that mean it has to be implemented by the club or it's not a rule if it's not implemented? Yeah, so when I use that term model local rule, those are all in the very back of the official guide. And for those to apply, either the committee in charge of the course or competition has to say we're using it. So they're kind of optional things for a committee. Yeah. Say you got a driver and it's a little loose and you pull your wrench out and tighten that down. Is that considered building a club? No, so if during the round you have a driver head that becomes loose, we've got a damaged club, you can go ahead and tighten that uh, to get it kind of as close to what it was when you started the round, and that's just repair of damage. All 
Okay, one more, yeah. A uh, quick question. Is there any uh, limitation on what club you can replace the original one with or do you stick to 14 clubs in the bag? So I love this question because I think this is one that trips people up sometimes. So if I have a club that gets damaged during the round, and let's say it's my seven iron that gets damaged during the round and I'm able to replace it, I can replace that with any club. It doesn't need to be another seven iron. So if I'm having a terrible day driving the ball and I wanna get a driver from the pro shop, I can do that. You're not bound to replace it with the same type of club that got damaged. Okay, um, the other subject about yardage books. So mm -hmm. if you're saying uh, if you can, if I'm dashing for somebody to practice down, you make some notes about the green, about, about the betting of the green, you see the dots in the green, you make, you see how it's going to break. So the turnaround the next day, once you get to the green, you cannot pull your book out, even though you've made your own notes, correct? Correct. This is going back to when we've got model local rule G12 in effect. You know, practice rounds, players are kind of free to do what they want. Um, so if you make notes in the yardage book about how the putting green is reading, you can do that. But once the ball's on the putting green, you can't use those notes to figure out the line of play. So it's not an automatic once you pull out the yardage book on the putting green, you're in breach. It's how you use it. Now, certainly the best practice is, is if you're using this and trying to educate players, best practice is, um, hmm, we'll figure that out, um, to leave the book in your pocket, right? Because then I don't have to come up and have a conversation with you about, hey, what, what were you doing when you pulled that book out of your pocket? When you get to the green. Correct. This only applies to a ball on the putting green. Say in the middle of the I'm not being, uh, say if you hit a shot on the green, you're already 50 yards out. The ball is on the green. Do you look at that yarding book in the middle of the fairway or as you're walking towards the green? No, no. If you are pulling out that yardage book when your ball's on the putting green to figure out a line of play, we have a breach. Okay, so you hit, you hit a, drive, a shot with your driver, the driver hit tracks. Mm -hmm. So your caddy goes in and gets a new driver. Well, you hooked your previous two drives, so you decide that you want to change the settings on the driver when you replace it. Can you re change the settings on the driver? Or the yeah, so if you are able to replace your driver and you are doing so, again, it's kind of that, as I was talking about the seven iron example, you're not bound to the same type setting on the driver that you had. Um, so you can replace it with a different type, different setting if you wanted to. Catherine, off of that question, mm -hmm. a crack club face is not damaged, is that correct? So we have to, when we're dealing with a cracked club face, this is where the question comes up about what local rules are in effect. Because if we have that model local rule about damaged clubs in effect, you're absolutely right that if the, the driver face is only cracked, that's not considered significantly damaged to replace it. Um, in the absence of that local rule, it is damage and you can replace it. So as we get set up here, I mean, I would just say a bit of um, refereeing advice. If you're out on the course and you have a club question that comes up, that would be the type of question that whoever your lead rules person is, your chief referee, I'd be radioing that into them. Um, if you're 100% on the answer, absolutely go ahead and handle it but I'd still radio it in after the fact just to let them know. Um, because you know, if we think about a stroke play situation, a playoff is gonna be a new round. So if you have a damaged club, we've gotta see is that still conforming for the new round. Um, so that's always something that, you know, if I'm at one of our championships, I'm always very appreciative of a referee who notifies us of that. Yeah, spinning off of that last question I had, if you're going to replace a club, it's got to be the entire club. You can't replace a club now, is that correct? Because that's building the club. So if you are able to replace the club, you can uh, get like a new shaft put on it, but it just can't be from components that you are carrying. So that's the difference. But if the pro shop has a shaft and can run it out to you, that's going to be just fine. Okay, so we had a, a number of good questions there in equipment. Uh, so I think we're ready to move on to our scorecard changes. 
And we just want to always keep in mind that when we are talking about scorecards, they are obviously in a stroke play only environment. We don't have uh, scorecards in match play that have the same official status. Uh, so the first item here relates to handicaps, that the player is no longer responsible for showing that handicap on the scorecard. This has been moved over to a committee responsibility. But when we think about the world handicap system that went into effect a few years ago, one of the things that quickly arose was some confusion about when we say the player needs the handicap on the scorecard, what handicap is that? You know, you've got the index, the course handicap. There was a lot of confusion there about, well, what is it that we want the player to show? And the other thing with this world handicap system is handicaps are readily available, right? Committees can go pull that information, make sure it's correct. And because we're in stroke play, we're just going out there trying to shoot the lowest round possible. We don't really need to deal with handicaps until we get to the end of the round and we're figuring out, okay, what did we shoot? Different than when we are in match play, and you're out there, you're playing against your opponent, there we have timeliness that is critical. We've got to be applying these handicap strokes throughout the round because we need to know, well, what's the status of our match here? What was the outcome of the hole? But in stroke play, we don't have that same urgency or the same need to deal with it throughout the round. So what we are able to do is make this a committee responsibility and we can deal with it at the end of the round, which is great. Optional local rule though for a committee who for whatever reason still wants the player to be responsible for showing that handicap on the card, they can use this and that's gonna put that responsibility right back on the player. A couple items related to marker certification or certification uh, in general in a moment that we'll see. Certification is so important, right? Because that's the player and the marker saying, okay, these are my scores. This is what I went out and shot on each individual hole. And this is really kind of an administrative item that I think will make our lives and perhaps even players' lives easier during the round. You know, you've got those three players who go out to play their round and somebody, for whatever reason, they're gonna drop out halfway through or partway through the round. Well, ideally what we were doing before is, okay, let's figure out the scorecard. Who were you marking for? Let's go ahead and have you sign off on those holes, get the scorecard back. Now we're saying, look, if that other player who's now gonna act as the marker, if they saw you play all those holes, they can just be your marker for the round. We don't need that individual who is leaving to certify hole scores before they leave. So when you get that call about a player who's dropping out midway through the round, you don't quite have that same urgency to try to get over there and make sure, okay, let's get the scorecards all sorted out before you depart. As long as the player was present when all those holes were being played, they can act as the marker for the rest of the round. And then this is a, a great new model local rule that we have for that missing certification. We're looking at that balance. Does the penalty fit the crime? And obviously certification is important, right? The player and marker are saying, look, this is what we went out or the player went out and shot. But for that missing certification, it's a disqualification penalty. It's pretty severe. And so this local rule gives the committee the option to say, look, we think a general penalty of two strokes in stroke play on the final hole of the round, that's enough. That's gonna cover a missing certification. This is an item that's on the USGA hard card. Um, I would anticipate this is gonna be pretty widely adopted by golf associations. Um, if you're at a club or a pro, certainly one that I would give some very heavy consideration to making sure that you have an effect for any stroke play competitions at your course. But a bit of a housekeeping note here, if you have this local rule and a missing certification, the committee still needs to do a bit of homework when they realize that we've got a certification missing. Because we still need either the player, if it's their certification missing, or the marker to verify the whole scores. So if I forget to sign my card, 
you're gonna wanna track me down in some way and say, okay, Catherine, read off, here are your whole scores, are these correct? So whether that's you know a phone call at the end of the day, is it asking me to stop by the rules office the next morning before my next round in the competition? You just wanna think that piece through because we still need me as the player to say, yep, okay, these scores are correct. Um, so it's not just, okay, we add two strokes to the last hole and we're good to go. You still wanna make sure you get in touch with either the player or the marker so we can verify that we've got a correct scorecard. Yes. Match play. Pretend I'm a 10. You're, you're not. Pretend you're a 10 and I'm a 15. Um, traditionally, in marking the card, I get three strokes on the three hardest holes. A pro several years ago told me that's not the proper way to do this. Because you get strokes on the first 10 as I get strokes on the first 10. So the additional dots, as we call them, should be on 11, 12, and 13. Because we're equal on the first 10. Which way is correct? So I, uh, I'm not good with our rules of handicapping. I admit that. Uh, so I may look for some assistance as Steve comes up to uh, help us work that through. If I understand the question correctly, if someone in this case is a 20 and the other is a 10, the 10 goes to zero, the 20 goes to 10, and then that's how you apply the handicap hole allocation like step. Allocated then on the hardest holes, the first 10 hardest holes. That would be correct, yes. But you always start with the lowest player at zero. On one of the pro telepaths, they were playing two sums, and someone had to retire during the round. What happens to the marker condition during that when there's only one player finishing the round? Yeah, so if you're in two sums versus that three sum example that I gave, there we would need that person who was acting as the marker to certify the holes that they were present for. And then that player who's left on their own, you know, if they can't get you know a referee right out there, they are really just gonna join up with you know a group around them and very likely the committee's going to approve that change because in stroke play, we do have the obligation that you've got to you know, finish the round with the group you started with, unless the committee approves a change before or after it happens. And in the case of a two-some and somebody dropping out, I'd be hard pressed to find a committee that's not gonna approve that player joining up with someone. Okay, so our playing the ball changes. We've got some bigger items here, uh, but we do start off with something a little bit uh, smaller. We've had this question for the last few years about, well, what happens if a referee worsens the conditions for the player? What's gonna happen in that case? We have a principle in the rules that generally, you are entitled to the conditions that are present when your ball comes to rest somewhere. And if somebody else worsens them, we're gonna get you back close to what you had. But what if a referee does it? Is the referee acting on behalf of the player? Are they taking direction from the player? And we've answered this question in this way for the last few years, but we didn't have anything that we could point to in the book and say, here's your answer. So we went ahead and added it in. And essentially, you as a referee, you're doing your job. Right? You're doing what you need to to get in there, make a ruling, help the player. You're not taking direction from the player. You're not acting on behalf of the player. So you know, certainly not an ideal situation, but if somehow you as a referee worsen conditions for the player, the player has those options that they have in rule eight to restore. So referees are just doing their job. The next item, this is another one of those changes that should kind of be leaping off the screen as a big item. We've uh, started to term this our Ricky Fowler rule. If you're familiar with what happened to him at the waste management a few years back, took relief from the penalty area, I believe had to drop twice and place the ball, and then that ball rolled back 
into the penalty area. At the time, we didn't have a mechanism to get that ball back out of the penalty area without taking relief from the penalty area again. What this change allows for now is that ball that is moved by natural forces. If it changes areas of the course or comes to rest out of bounds, the player is required to replace the ball on that spot. Now, while these situations don't happen terribly frequently, when they do happen, it's gone bad, right? It's a tough outcome. It doesn't make sense to the player to have to take penalty relief again in that Ricky Fowler example um, when he'd already done so. And we you know, had a spot that we could get the ball back. Um, so we do have a video that I will show before I offer a couple more thoughts here. Raj, it appears that Fowler has dropped the ball twice and the ball's gone back into the penalty area. That's correct, Gary. So now placing the ball where the ball struck the course on the second drop. Well, he's in a tough spot here. And <laughs> I mean, you could really have issues. I mean, with a good shot from this position, it's an indication of how closely mown the grass is and how steep the bank is. Ricky's looking. That's crazy uh, how that ball sat there for all that time. So obviously a tough and unfortunate situation that we had, but there's a few points that I want to call out in this rule. First, it's only going to apply when the player has dropped, placed, or replaced, right? So if we haven't done that, my ball's just sitting in the fairway and moves due to natural forces into a bunker, this rule doesn't apply to me. So first, we have to have dropped, placed, or replaced, and then that ball, it's got to change areas of the course or come to rest out of bounds. So in Ricky's example here, if that ball just moved somewhere else in the general area, somewhere else in the rough, this rule isn't getting triggered. He didn't change areas of the course. So that's really important. The other piece here is that this is a requirement when this happens. This is not an option to the player. So you could think of a situation where you drop under lateral penalty relief near a putting green. Natural forces moves that ball onto the putting green. You're required to replace it in that case, even though that's the better outcome that the player probably would want to accept, they have to replace the ball. This isn't an option that the player gets. I think we'll see this uh, come into play with penalty areas, as in this example, taking relief for an embedded ball near a bunker, right? That's another place that we could see this come into effect. Um, but definitely, I think a welcome change for players that, you know, there's not that same urgency or the same unfortunate outcome if you don't play the ball in time. I'm lost. <laughs> so with Rick, yes. would he, under the new rule, would he have been penalized or would he be able or required to put his ball back where it was, no penalty? Yeah, so for Ricky's situation, let's say this just happened you know, a few weeks ago at the Waste Management under the 23 rules of golf. Ricky would not get an additional penalty. He's got one because he took relief from the penalty area, but he would be replacing a ball on that spot that he had taken relief from the penalty area. And he would play from there with no additional penalty. This ball was where his foot is now and it was embedded and then he dropped it and it rolled in a bunker. Is that a new area or is that, it's not a penalty area. Is, would he, could he play for the bunker or does he have to redrop it? So if Ricky had taken relief for an embedded ball where his foot is. up here, let's say he had taken relief and that ball came to rest in the general area as required. If that ball then rolled into the bunker due to natural forces, he would be required to replace it because he has effectively, he's taken that relief, he's dropped, the ball's moved due to natural forces and it changed areas of the course. If you're, if you're on the green, you've got your ball on the green, it's very windy, you mark it, you're getting ready to putt and the wind blows it. Do you have to put it back where it was or do you play it from where the wind took it? So with respect to the putting green, we've got a different rule that applies to a ball at rest moved on the putting green. If you have lifted and replaced your ball on the putting green and it moves due to any reason, you're replacing it without penalty. You do put it back. You do put it back, yes. No penalty, but you've got to put it back. 
But if a ball clearly is hit from 150 yards in, is resting at rest on the green, and a gust of wind comes and blows it back down into the fairway, you, you would have to play it back there. Correct. So if I hit my ball up onto the putting green, I haven't lifted and replaced it. I'm just walking on up and wind blows that ball into the fairway, I'm playing from that new position. Generally speaking, when a ball at rest gets moved by natural forces, you're playing from the new position. This rule and then the putting green rule that I mentioned, those are exceptions to that general principle. In that Ricky situation, let's say there's a sprinkler head above that water. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't have to be a penalty situation. It can be a, if he's granted relief and that blows, he still gets the same three foot back. Correct. It's not a requirement that the player has taken penalty relief. If I take relief from an immovable obstruction, I drop, and then that ball moves due to natural forces and changes areas of the course, I'm required to replace it. So back to the putting thing. I'm walking up to the putting green. My ball was on there. The wind blows and it takes it closer to the hole. I can go up and mark it closer to the hole because I've never marked it to begin with. Correct. If you have not marked, or excuse me, if you have not lifted and replaced, that's the trigger in that rule. If you've just hit up onto the putting green and wind blows that ball closer to the hole, you're playing from the new position. It's that act of lifting and replacing and the act of kind of this dropping, placing, replacing, and taking relief that we can think of as then owning a spot. So if you mark the ball but don't pick it up and it moves, you play it where it goes to. Correct. If you have just marked your ball on the putting green but you have not lifted it um, and it moves due to natural forces, you're playing from the new position. Lifting and replacing is what's going to trigger owning the spot on the putting green. Okay. All right, so a bit of a smaller item after that big change. And this was uh, a bit of an oversight uh, when it came to the 2019 rules of golf. This question of, what if I clean my ball, but I don't lift it? There's a clump of mud on the ball, perhaps I'm able to flick, up, flick it off, get rid of it without lifting or moving that ball. What penalty am I getting? Well, we didn't have the option to give that player a penalty for cleaning the ball when not allowed. So what we had to do is we had to go into our rule eight, which is all about playing the course as you find it, and look at it through that lens and say, well, did that act of cleaning the ball, did that improve the lie of the ball? And then if we determined it did, that results in that big general penalty, loss of hole in match play, two strokes in stroke play. But any other time the player cleans the ball when not allowed, it's just one penalty stroke. So we've gone ahead and added this in that, look, if you clean the ball without lifting it, it's one penalty stroke. It doesn't need to be a general penalty. All right, uh, another Fairly big change that we have here relates to back on the line relief. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and play a video that we have on this change and then we can chat through it. The rules of golf are changing in 2023. The back on the line relief procedure has been simplified and here's what it looks like. So to use a penalty area as an example, I'm gonna keep the point where the ball last crossed between the hole and where I wanna drop it. I can go back as far as I want on the line, but I have to drop it on the line because that's what activates this relief option. If I don't drop it on the line, I'll be dropping in a wrong way. The relief area won't be created and I'll have to correct my mistake by dropping it again, but in the right way on the line. But once dropped on the line, the ball can roll up to one club length in any direction even if it rolls forward and closer to the hole. Back on the line is a great relief option for penalty areas, but you can also use it when you decide that your ball is unplayable. That was Jay Roberts, who is uh, now part of our USGA rules team. He joined us about six months ago or so at this point. Uh, and if you follow the USGA on Instagram or any social media, you will have seen some of the videos that Jay has been putting out. 
He does a really nice job of just kind of boiling it down to what are the, the key points that the player needs to know. Typically every Wednesday on Instagram, you'll see a new video from Jay. Uh, so if you don't follow the USGA, uh, perhaps that's a good reason to. And if you work with, you know, junior players in high school golf, even, you know, clubs with your members, these videos would be a nice way to share some really simple rules information with those players in a way that would be helpful for them. Jay really tries to focus in on what are the frequent questions that we're getting at the USGA? What are we hearing again and again? How can we help golfers know the rules better? Jay had put together this video on back on the line relief and did a really nice job of hitting the key points. This was an item that for the 2019 rules, we tried to make all relief fit the same format, fit the same pattern, right? You've always got a reference point, you've got one or two club lengths, and then we'll put some limitations on where that goes. But what we figured out pretty quickly with back on the line relief, it, it was a bit of trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Back on the line relief is just different. It's a different relief procedure. It didn't fit in this mold that we had. What happened was, is you as a referee could be sitting out on the course and see a player drop, ball might roll forward a little bit, and you would have no idea, is that ball in the relief area or do we have a player who's about to play from a wrong place? So what it led to is referees in an effort to help players, which is what we're there to do, having to go out in situations and intervene where the player was then perhaps a little put off by that. So we had a a model local rule that we used for the last four years that basically gave the player a choice if they didn't have a reference point. Either play the ball as it lies or drop again. Typically, the rules aren't gonna give that player that type of choice. Do you wanna play this ball as it lies or not? So working on figuring out how to make back on the line relief work was a big part of this rules revision cycle. What we've done is we have rewound time and gone back to where we were before 2019. Now you have to drop on the line. We've just recognized back on the line relief is different. It doesn't make sense to try to make it the same as every other relief procedure. You gotta drop on the line. I believe Jay said this, but if you don't drop on the line, we don't have a relief area, which means if you play that ball, where have you played from? Wrong place, yep, so we have to drop on the line. And then from there, we drop on the line, we have then activated the relief area. That ball can roll up to one club length in any direction. The ball can roll up to one club length closer to the hole, and that's okay, we're playing the ball from that spot. So the player no longer gets that choice that they've had for the last four years to either drop again or play the ball as it lies. The rule's gonna tell the player what they have to do. So again, dropping on the line is critical here. I'm not sure how many players were aware they could drop off the line before, but definitely an item that if you're interacting and dealing with players, make sure they're aware of this, that they've gotta drop on the line. Uh, I still have two other options if I go into a penalty area, right? I can hit from where I hit from, or I can take the two strokes relief from where it entered into the hazard of the penalty area. Penalty area. Correct. So back on the line relief is one of the player's options for a penalty area. We're going to touch on penalty area later today, and so we'll see those other options. But this is only going to apply when the player is taking back on the line relief from a penalty area back on the line relief for an unplayable ball, as well as those options we have for dropping out of a bunker using this option. So Catherine, if the committee has painted the area like next to that green, but the ball didn't cross the painted line, hit on the ground, goes back in. So where has it last crossed the penalty area? Is it the intention? You can't draw a line on the very edge of the dirt. Know what I mean? Um, so let me, I'll try to answer it, and if I didn't, perhaps let's chat at a break. When we're dealing with penalty areas, those edges go vertically up and down. 
So a ball can last cross the edge of a penalty area somewhere in the air. So if that's the spot it last entered, that's what we're gonna use for taking back on the line relief or for a red penalty area, that lateral relief. All right, so that, so that line is simply an indicator that there's relief there, whereas the line for out of bounds, that is locked in. If a red or yellow line is defining the edge of a penalty area, that is the edge of the penalty area. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Where did the ball last cross? But because we're kind of pretending, right? We're imagining it goes up and down. That spot it last entered could be vertically in the air somewhere. So we see here, this is uh, for a yellow penalty area. The player looking at that back on the line option got to drop on the line. And then from there, that ball can roll up to one club length in any direction. For taking back on the line relief? No, so the player is not required to mark anything when they're taking back on the line relief because the requirement is, is you have to drop on that line. And then once the player drops on the line, it can roll up to one club length. So when if the player thinks maybe this ball's getting close to being outside of the relief area, effectively they're estimating where the ball first touched the line to figure it out. One of the options the player has for an abnormal course condition in the bunker, we'll talk about this in our free relief section, is to take back on the line relief outside of the bunker using back on the line. And again, this applies any time we're using this back on the line procedure. It's not specific to penalty areas. A few items related to accidental deflections on the putting green. The good news is, if you were comfortable with how we've operated for the past few years with the clarifications and model local rules related to this topic, you're set. You've got it. <laughs> this was a, a space that I think candidly probably surprised us a bit for some of the, the outcomes and situations that came up. And what that led to is we, we issued some clarifications related to how do we wanna treat accidental deflections on the putting green. So this did lead to some complexity in the rules, but it's always this balance of complexity versus desired outcomes. What's in the best interest of the game? And so we got to a spot where we felt like this rule made sense and just moved all of those clarifications that we had issued right into the rule. So we have some situations on the putting green where if we have a certain type of accidental deflection, the player has to replay the stroke. So if that ball hits a person, a movable obstruction, or an animal, you are replaying the stroke. Replay is a new phrase in this rule. We previously said that stroke doesn't count and you have to play again from where you last played from. At first glance, replay versus stroke doesn't count. It doesn't seem like that big of an outcome change, but replay now says, player, you have to do this, right? It's on you. So if I play from on the putting green and you know I accidentally hit this little dog that's running by, I have to replay. So if I do that, I put a ball back on the spot I last played from and play again, that stroke that had that accidental deflection, that goes away, right? We're not gonna count that in my score. I'm not getting any penalty and I'm gonna continue on with play of the hole. But what if I don't know that I have to replay? I just think I'm gonna go hit the ball from where it came to rest. Because I didn't replay, I'm gonna get a general penalty. I'm gonna get loss of hole in match play, two strokes in stroke play. But again, because I didn't replay, we're gonna count that stroke that had the accidental deflection in my score. And the rule very specifically tells us this is not a wrong place. So this helps us in a couple ways. The first being that if this is not a wrong place, in stroke play, we don't have to ask the follow-up question, is it a serious breach? Are we potentially getting into a disqualification? We don't have that at play here because this is not a wrong place. The other being, 
Let's say I have one of these accidental deflections, but the ball goes in the hole. And I have no idea that I'm supposed to go back and replay. So I pick that ball up out of the hole, take off to the next hole and play my tee shot. Before, because that stroke didn't count, what had I not done? I hadn't hold out, which in stroke play is a disqualification. So this helps us in that way that for the player who fails to replay, we can just give them a general penalty and they can play on and we'll count that stroke that they should have replayed in their score. So Andrew McGee made a hold one on number 17 at TBC Scottsdale, which went off of a guy's shoe, if I, if I remember that. So that would not have is that correct? So what I'm talking about here, this is for strokes that are made from on the putting green. So if you've played from the tee, this does not apply to you. Generally speaking, our principle for accidental deflections is you're gonna play the ball as it lies and accept the outcome, good or bad. What your example for the hole in one is obviously a good example. Uh, but for strokes from on the putting green, we do treat those differently, right? Because it's just a different environment, right? You're playing the ball along the surface of the hole. You're not really anticipating anything being there like it might be for some other strokes. The pin is not considered an immovable obstruction then? No, so if the ball hits the flag stick, if you've left it in the hole, we're playing that ball as it lies. Yeah? What about someone's mark? So if you hit either a ball at rest on the putting green or a ball marker, you're going to play that ball as it lies. And we're going to get to the cases where we're going to play the ball as it lies on the next piece here. We're going to get there. So here we go. So strokes played again from on the putting green, accidental deflections. If we hit me, the player who made the stroke, or the club I used to make the stroke, we're playing the ball as it lies. And an animal defined as a loose impediment. If we hit that animal defined as a loose impediment, we're playing the ball as it lies. So I, I, I putted the ball. When I looked up, the ball was going at the hole, just crept in left edge. Oh, just hung off. It got away. He's just showed me the video. He actually ran straight over the, the poor bug. Hopefully I didn't hurt him. If you knowingly hit an animal, and a bug is considered an animal, during the course of a stroke, certainly on the putting green, you have to replay it. Um, I didn't knowingly hit it. Situation with Paul Casey a couple years ago, there's a bit of some old rules information in there, but the takeaway for the 23 rules you play from the putting green, you hit that loose impediment, that animal defined as a loose impediment, I should say. We're going to play the ball as it lies. We're not replaying. So the you're if you play from the putting green and you hit an animal, as long as that animal isn't defined as a loose impediment, you must replay. And animals that are defined as loose impediments are very small insects. So a butterfly following the ball. <laughs> the ball. So a question there with the butterfly. At some point, you know, we're looking at how small, how big is the butterfly, and we've got to figure out is it a loose impediment or not. We have a reporting requirement for a player in stroke play who has played from a wrong place. They think it's a serious breach. And so they correct it and they try to play out the hole with two balls, right? I'm not sure if I need to correct this or not. I'm gonna play out the hole with two balls and then let the committee figure it out. In that case, because I'm playing out the hole with two balls, I have to report to the committee. I've gotta tell them this put it in their hands and let them figure out which ball is going to count. And that's true even if I think I've scored the same with both balls. Because effectively, we have a player who's kind of put their hand up and said, look, I'm not really sure what I did. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. So even if the, that player thinks they have the same score with both balls, we've got to get it into the committee's hands to let them figure it out. What this solves is if we think back to the question we had earlier today, 
I don't remove or I don't replace my ball marker on the putting green when I moved it a club head over. And then I think I have to correct that. And so I play out that hole with just one ball. Technically in the 19 rules, I had to report that. Um, but because I've only played out the hole with one ball, I don't have to report to the committee, but we're in stroke play, so we still have our scorecard rule operating. I still have the same responsibility to get my whole score correct. So if the whole score is incorrect, we're gonna deal with that, but we don't have a disqualification in that case for failing to report. But is there a time timing on the report? Yes, so the requirement to report to the committee is before the scorecard is returned in stroke play. So whatever is considered to be returned, a lot of the time it's, you know, once you leave the scoring area, that's the point that the scorecard's considered returned. So you have up until whatever that point is. So if Victor Hovland's mom calls in and tells him he didn't move it once, he moved it twice and didn't play, that was hours later when he, when he came back to the committee. So with Victor Hovland failing to get his uh, ball marker back on the right spot, he just played from a wrong place. He didn't try to correct anything, so we don't have a reporting requirement there. This is, you know, I play from a wrong place in taking penalty area relief, and I'm not sure if I need to correct it or not. So I play out the hole with two balls. Now I've got to tell the committee before I get that scorecard returned. Next, we have an item for embedded ball relief. When we're taking relief for an embedded ball, our reference point, which is where we're gonna to start to measure this one club length relief area, we say it's right behind where that ball is embedded. Now we have clarified that, look, that's gotta be in the general area. For most of the time that you are taking embedded ball relief, you won't even notice this change. Right, Most of the time, the spot right behind that embedded ball is in the general area. And when I say general area, I'm really speaking about rough and fairway if you wanna think of it that way. So most of the time, we're not gonna see this. Where we could see this change affect things is I've got a ball that is embedded right above a bunker, or I have a ball that is embedded just above a penalty area line. So we'll take a look at a video uh, where we would have a slightly different outcome now. <laughs> Here's Woods from the bunker and hit the face, Andy. Take another look here. He's bringing a rules official in here. Looking for it, trying to figure out where it was, and can, can this day get any worse at this point? Bring it, Tom Carpus from PGA of America. Tom, this is a pretty straightforward ruling, right, for an embedded ball. Uh, yes, it is, Scott. I mean, basically, the earthen lip of the of the above the sand is part of the general area. So, therefore, when the ball's embedded, you find the reference point directly behind where the ball's embedded. Measure within a club length, drop it, and uh, Ben Shade, our guest from the USGA, one of our officials, took uh, good care of Tiger, and he's back in play. So we got to see Ben Shade in action there from the USGA rules team. Ben oversees our governance function, so both for the rules of golf as well as amateur status. Uh, if you've had an opportunity to either take a workshop with Ben or interact with him, he's you know one of the best rules minds that we have at the USGA. So Tiger was in good hands with Ben. And then we also got to hear from Tom Karpis, uh, who's with the PGA of America Rules Committee. He's also out on the Champions Tour now as a referee. I've gotten to teach a couple workshops with Tom, and he is always great. Um, so if you have a chance to attend a workshop he's teaching, you'll really enjoy it. But with the Tiger drop here, 
When we saw then trying to figure out where are we gonna start this relief area from, in this case, the spot right behind that embedded ball was in the bunker. So what he would now do is rather than starting from that spot, he's likely moving two, three inches kind of over to the left to start from in the general area. So the relief area changes a little bit in this case, not significantly, but we've got to start from in the general area. Most of the time, it's gonna be something like this, where we're gonna move a couple inches, maybe a little bit more, you know, right, left, behind, depending upon how our geometry shakes out. But there could be some situations where maybe the player does have to move a more significant distance. It all just depends upon what the circumstances are and how it shakes out. There's a, a clarification in the embedded ball rule uh, which basically says just that. Most of the time, it's gonna be right there, maybe a little bit away, but it could be farther. It just depends upon the situation. So the embedded ball is in the fairway, so no problems. Do you get the club length from the reference point or it's right behind the ball, the, where you drop? When you're taking relief for an embedded ball, you have a one club length relief area and you're starting from this reference point, which as we've been talking about, that has to be in the general area. For most of the time you're taking embedded ball relief, you won't even notice that this has been changed. But for this type of circumstances, you know, ball right above a penalty area line, that's where we would see this affect things. So under no circumstances is his relief in the trap. No, so when you are taking relief for an embedded ball, we only get relief in the general area, so not in that bunker. And the relief area, which we'll talk about later today, is limited to that general area. So if any part of Tiger's one club length was in the bunker, think of that as being X'd out. That is not part of his relief area. And you said, okay, it went, you couldn't go back, but you also couldn't just take it from the indentation either come out sideways. He had to go backwards and then go sideways because he couldn't go back. Right. Our reference point here is not where the ball's at rest. It's right behind where the ball was embedded. So that's where we've got to start from. With respect to searching for the ball, I think we all know now that we've just got those three minutes to find and identify the ball and we're gonna give the player a reasonable amount of time to identify the ball when it's found towards the end of those three minutes, right? Sometimes we find a ball and it might take us a minute or two to figure out if it's ours, right? We may have to lift it for identification. Perhaps it's up in a tree and we're trying to see our identifying mark. We're not always able to just walk up and go, yep, that's mine, here we go. So what this is saying is if we find a ball towards the end of that search, that reasonable time a player should be given is one minute. I find a ball up in a tree and I'm trying to see if it's mine. I find it at about 2.30 into my search. The committee should give me a minute to try and see if that's my ball or not. The search clock keeps running. We've got to keep that in mind. So I'm going to get up until three minutes and 30 seconds to identify that ball as being mine. If I'm either unable to identify it as being mine or any time after those, that three minutes is up, I go, nope, that's actually not my ball. Well, the ball's lost. And because the three minutes is up, I don't have any more time to search. And if your ball's stuck in a palm tree and you can't identify it, is it considered lost then? If your ball is up in a tree and you're unable to identify it as being yours within those three minutes, yeah, the ball's lost. So this one minute that I'm speaking to, this is only going to be triggered when you find a ball towards the end of search. So anytime it's found, a ball is found at about two minutes and 30 or later, that's when we're gonna give you this one minute. Um, and the situation kind of stemmed from an event that happened out on the PGA Tour where a player was trying to identify a ball in a tree and they knew a different referee on the course had some binoculars in his bag. 
So that referee starts, you know, rolling over there trying to get there to give the binoculars. And this question came up of, well, how long can we wait for the binoculars to show up? Um, being able to search and identify the ball needs to be done promptly. And so we can't sit there for, you know, two, three, on and on. We can't keep sitting there waiting. So the rules have now specified that, look, the most time that player should be given is a minute. And unfortunately, if you can't find the ball within that time, it's going to be lost and you'll have to take stroke and distance relief. The, the clarification you see up on the screen, 18.2A1-3, that's where we give this minute. And we also note that this is in addition to a reasonable amount of time to get to where the ball is. Search can happen over quite a large area, right, as you're scrambling to try to find the ball. So if somebody says, you know, hey, Catherine, we think it, we got your ball here and it takes me 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is to walk over there. And again, the ball's found towards the end of the search. Once I've had that reasonable time to get there, that's when this one minute would then get triggered. So as it relates to advice and help, all of these items we're gonna chat through, they relate back to the USGA and the RNA believing that being able to figure out the line of play, being able to line yourself up is really an essential skill in the game. So we've put some guardrails around what the player can do in these instances. These are all items that are found in rule 10.2b. Um, if you are really into the rules, this is definitely a rule I would recommend you take some time and read through. There's some subtle outcome changes that we're gonna talk through, but it's a good rule just to refresh yourself on. The first item here is now, regardless of where your ball is at on the course, you can't set down an object to show the line of play. We used to treat the putting green versus everywhere else differently, and now we've just said, look, no matter where your ball is at on the course, you can't set down an object to show the line of play. And an object is gonna be considered to be set down when it has been placed and I've let go of it. So if my caddy is just pointing while holding a club, a flag stick, whatever it might be, pointing out the line of play, but they're still holding on to that object, we haven't set anything down. If this water, ball, water bottle that we see here with Arnie, if that was set down, it was placed and let go of to show the line of play, we've got a breach of this rule. And this is a breach that can't be undone. We can't pick up the object and avoid the penalty. Once we've set down the object for this purpose, we've got ourselves a general penalty, loss of hole in match play, two strokes in stroke play. This has been part of the rule since 2019 that we can't set down an object to help with taking our stance. And again, that set down, it's placed and let go of. So if you have a player who's just holding a club perhaps against their legs, they haven't set down that object, so that's okay. This is not okay, right? The object has been placed to help with taking the stance. And again, we can't undo the breach. Once we placed the object for this reason, we've earned that general penalty. We had issued, I believe, a, a digital clarification on this that, well, rather than setting down an object, I drew a line through some dew to help with taking my stance. Effectively, you have done the same thing. So whether it's you're drawing a line in dew, you're flattening down a line in the rough to help with taking your stance, we're gonna go ahead and treat that as being a breach. And again, we can't get out of this. We can't undo it. Then we have our caddy alignment rule. Similar to the putting green rules that we talked through with those accidental deflections, if you've been comfortable with the clarifications we've had for the last four years, you're largely in good shape for how we're operating. This was a rule that we, we first had in 2019, and I think we all knew 
the behavior that was we were trying to eliminate that we didn't want as part of the game of golf. But what happened was is writing a rule that just eliminated that behavior proved challenging. The rule that as it was written covered more ground than we wanted it to. And we got some outcomes and penalties that didn't make sense. They weren't in the best interest of the game. So we issued a series of clarifications to narrow this rule back down to just eliminate the behavior that we didn't want in the game. So again, largely those clarifications have been worked in. We've turned the area where the caddy can't be to give aiming help as the restricted area. And that's gonna be that extension of the line of play behind the ball, plus a little bit on either side. That's where we can't have the caddy to give aiming help. We've broken it out into aiming help versus other help. Once I begin to take my stance, I've got one foot in position for that stance, my caddy can't be back there to help me with aiming. And we know that that includes, you know, a silent behavior where the caddy just stands there and then moves away to signal that I'm lined up correctly, right? That very traditional behavior that we didn't want in the game. This is something that we can undo, different than those other items with, in this topic. If I have begun to take my stance and the caddy is back there to give me aiming help, as long as I haven't made the stroke, I can get out of there, get out of the batter's box, have my caddy move away, and then I can go ahead and retake the stance on my own. Then we have this bucket of other help. We think about a situation where my ball is near, you know, some bushes and trees, and I'm trying to figure out what am I gonna hit potentially as I take this club back. The caddy can be in this restricted area after I have begun to take my stance to help me figure out what I'm gonna hit. Yep, no, I think over here, I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be able to play. They can be back there for that reason just as long as they move away before I make the stroke. But we call out that this can't be part of your routine on every shot. The caddy can't claim to be back there to give this other help on every shot because at that point, we're really moving into that aiming help territory. I did wanna call out another piece that has been added into this rule. Uh, firstly, this does also apply to the partner and the partner's caddy, if we're in those partner formats of play. But regardless of the form of play, I could have someone other than my caddy or my partner or partner's caddy stand in that restricted area to help track the flight of the ball. It's early in the day, it's getting late in the day, there's a lot of sun. I could ask somebody else in my group to stand back there to help track the flight of the ball. I can ask somebody else to do that. I can't ask my caddy to do that, or my partner or my partner's caddy, but somebody else can stand back there for that reason. That's gonna be okay. Catherine, at one time didn't the line of play extend past the pin? And is that also included in the restricted area? No, so the line of play, I believe at one point did extend beyond the hole. Very simply now, the line of play is where do you intend the ball to go? Okay. Whatever that is, is your line of play. The restricted area is behind the ball only. So we talk a lot about this rule being about aiming help. If that caddy tries to or is positioned somewhere other than the restricted area and tries to give aiming help, that's okay. This rule is very specific to being in the restricted area to give that aiming help. For our high school and college events, advice giver? Yes, so we will see that when we're in those team formats and we have an advice giver, right, coach in high school and college, coach can't be back there for this reason. Coach is gonna be treated just like the caddy. So the caddy could actually stand on the other side of the hole and say, hit the ball toward me. So the caddy could stand on the other side of the hole and say, aim towards me. That's okay, but the caddy would have to move before the stroke is made. If the caddy stands in that position when the stroke is made, we're gonna have a breach.
This part of the rule 10.2b4 is very specific to the restricted area behind the ball for aiming help. If you have, you know, a blind shot over a hill, Caddy can go up and stand there and go, okay, you know, right about here, we're in line with the hole. This is where you want to be. That's okay. Caddy's got to move before the stroke gets made. So, so on a bottom putting green, Caddy stands on the opposite side of the hole. On her example, that's different than a water bottle on the other side of the hole. Water bottle permanent and done, but the Caddy can move. Correct. Yeah, that's a good point to note. When we talk about setting down an object to show a line of play, that is different than caddy standing somewhere to show the line of play. Once an object is set down to show the line of play, we've got a breach. Caddy saying, okay, aim towards me. Caddy has to move before the stroke is made. And would you clarify the one foot in the stance? Once, if the caddy is behind you, and I put one foot in the stance. Is that a reach or is that point can the cat still move? So if I have begun to take my stance, which is I've got one foot in position, if the caddy is in the restricted area to give that aiming help, technically I have breached the rule, but I can undo it. If I get out and caddy moves away, we're fine. If I make the stroke we're, without backing out of the batter's box, that's going to be a penalty. All right, so as it relates to the self-standing putter, if you have an official guide here with you, that big book, this would be a good spot to make a note in your clarifications that what is printed in the book is not how we are going to operate for the next couple years. There's a, a couple clarifications within 10.2b that very clearly states that this behavior you see up on the slide would be a breach of the rules. We have issued some additional digital clarification saying this is going to continue to be okay until January 1st of 25. So we can continue to use self-standing putters in this manner up until January 1st, 25. And once the calendar flips to that date, this would then be considered a breach of the rule. So we are delaying implementation of that clarification in your book. So a good spot to make a note if you have the book. Um, we do have the digital clarifications added in to the Rules of Golf app. So if that's what you're using, you can just kind of know that those will be up to date. This item here is specific to match play. There's a, a clarification that changes what we have for a while treated as being an agreement to waive the rules. In match play, we're in this small little bubble, right? It's just me against my opponent. If I want to overlook a breach by my opponent, that's okay. The only person who's potentially going to get harmed by that is me. And we used to say that, look, if you're going to overlook a breach, silence is golden, right? Don't talk about it. This clarification has now changed that, where we can talk about it while we're playing the hole. That's okay. Just as long as the player who has decided to overlook the breach, they arrive to that decision on their own. I'm in a match. I'm grounding my club in the bunker as I'm making some practice swings. I'm in breach of the bunker rules. Technically, I should lose the hole, but if my opponent wants to overlook it, they can. What this clarification allows for is my opponent can say to me, you know, hey, Catherine, that was actually a penalty. You're not allowed to do that, but don't worry about it. I'm not going to apply the penalty, right? There are already so many up in the match. It doesn't matter. That's okay. What is not okay is if the two of us are then involved in that decision and we know there should be a penalty. So if we start discussing, you know, hey, that should be a penalty, you know, I'd really like you to not apply it if you don't mind. Okay, I guess, yeah, okay, that's fine. We won't apply it. That's different. Both players in the match were involved in the decision not to apply a penalty that they knew of. So once both players are involved and they are aware of what they should be doing and they choose to do something different, at that point, they have agreed to waive a rule of golf and they're going to be disqualified. Which is different than it used to be. We were always told that in match play tournament, in match play, as long as 
you agree, it's okay. And now you're saying you can't agree. What this is speaking to is if you know what the rule is. In both match play and stroke play, to agree to waive a rule of golf, you have to know the rule of golf. So if me and my opponent are in the match and you know I'm getting ready to take relief from a cart path and I say, you know, it's two club lengths, right, for my relief area, and the opponent goes, yeah, I think that's right, that's what I always do, and I take that, we haven't waived a rule of golf, right? We're in ignorance here. We think we're doing the right thing, but we're not. That's okay, we're not agreeing to waive anything. Different than I ask my opponent, is it one or two club links? And the opponent says, well, it's one. And I say, well, you know, I'd really like two. I don't really like where one gets me. Do you mind if I take another one? And then the opponent goes, yeah, okay, we can do that. Now the two of us are involved in that decision. We're choosing to do something other than what we know we should. Now we've waived a rule of golf. And I'm sorry to ask another question, but back to advice. Caddies cannot stand in back. So team play, my partner wants to watch the way the ball rolls. And Let's, I see this rule both ways. Can my partner stand behind me? We're going to get there. Okay. So we'll talk about that in just a moment when we get to um, our other forms of play. So our last section here, we've got rules 1 through 25 in the back of the book. As it relates to rule 21, rule 21 is largely other forms of stroke play. And these are forms where effectively we can give the player a maximum, a worst possible outcome, right? In Stableford, we can get zero points. In maximum score, we've set a maximum score, whatever that might be. When I was playing junior, uh, junior varsity golf in high school, we used to play circle 10. Couldn't do worse than a 10, right? 10 you picked up, it was max score. Then we have par bogey, which we can lose the hole. So we have situations in stroke play where we are required to correct certain situations. We talked about failing to hole out. I've got to correct that before I start the next hole. I play from outside the teeing area in stroke play. I've got to correct before I start the next hole. Rather than disqualifying the player in these formats, we're just going to give the player the worst possible outcome. Zero points in Stableford, max score in max score, loss of hole in par bogey. So we can keep players playing in these formats. Um, so for club play, high school golf, juniors, these are nice options because you avoid some potential disqualifications. People can pick up, keeps pace moving, and we don't have to worry about some disqualifications here. We previously had certain penalties within these rules that the committee, that the player had to report to the committee because then the committee was going to make some sort of adjustment to whatever the total was. We've said, look, we're just going to apply the rules as they are written in these formats. You don't have to report to the committee anymore. So we don't have any reporting requirements in these formats of play. And again, for the disqualifications and stroke play where we have required corrections, we're just going to give the player the worst outcome that they could have gotten. Definitely. I don't understand the except on that previous chart, except for the five times, I, that five times gets zero points for helping you there. So those five times is referring to what I was talking about with required corrections in stroke play. So you fail to hole out, you've got to correct before you start the next hole or return the scorecard if it happens on the last hole. Playing from outside the tee is one of those, playing a wrong ball is one of those. So when we're required to correct, if we fail to, and I'm playing max score and it's circle 10, I'm just gonna get a 10 on that hole. I'm not gonna be disqualified. And there's five times you do that? There's five required corrections. Yeah, that's what I'm, that is what that is speaking to. All right, so now we're in our partner formats of play, and this is going to get to the question that we had. We're in foursomes or four ball. I've got this partner. As I mentioned, that partner, they can't be back in the restricted area to give me that aiming help. But what about the partner who wants to see my line of putt as I hit so they can figure out what they want to do? They're not in the restricted area to help me. We have a rule in both foursomes and four ball that says, look, you're not there 
to help your partner, but because you're there to help yourself, that's a breach. So we're gonna give the partner a penalty in that case. Partner's standing on that extension behind the ball to see how my putt breaks. Not there to help me, they wanna see the break. If I make the stroke with them there, they're gonna be in breach of the rule. So this is really kind of closing off that loophole now that 10.2b4 has been focused in on aiming help specifically. Quickly here for advice givers, we have this question. If you have that designated advice giver, coach in high school and collegiate golf, we're gonna treat coach just like the caddy. They can't be back there. They have those same restrictions about being in the restricted area. And then our last item here, I touched on this at the very beginning as it relates to inclusivity in the rules. We're very excited and proud to have rule 25 just in the book like any other rule of golf. So for any players who have a disability and need these modifications, they are readily available. Committees don't need to do anything to make sure that they are there for them. I mentioned that we just hosted our inaugural adaptive open down in Pinehurst. Um, I was not able to work that championship, but in talking to our staff that was there, our committee who volunteered as rules officials, everybody just raved about the experience, that it was you know, one of the best weeks of their life overall, getting to be involved in adaptive golf and work with those players. Certainly our hope is through Rule 25, hosting the Adaptive Open, that we'll continue to see a growth in that adaptive golf community. They've been you know, having tournaments for a long time. We're certainly not the first to do this, but certainly hope through shedding a light on it, more organizations, more individuals, will get involved in that adaptive golf space. That is gonna bring us to the end of these major changes that we had. Um, so happy to take any last minute questions or if we are ready for a lunch break, I understand that. Yeah. Going back just the one or two there, when we were talking about the partner standing behind, you said in four ball and four stones, that's not allowed, if it didn't match play, it would be allowed if you're playing a partner so if you can play either four sums or four ball as stroke play or match play, and regardless of if it's stroke play or match play, the partner can't be in that restricted area. 